It's into Bitcoin's peer-to-peer -peer network. Thanks for the intro. Um, um, yeah, I'm Johannes, as <laughs> Joe already told you. Online I go by virtue, like it says on the slides. I'm currently a spiral grantee, and I work on monitoring the health of the Bitcoin network. And my slide today, um, my talk today, is going to be about sharing some of the insights um, I've, I've got so far. Um, before talking about the actual Bitcoin network, I'd like to take a step back um, and talk about uh, DNS seeds because they're a crucial part of the network as well, of the network infrastructure. Um, so you might ask yourself, what are DNS seeds and why should we care about them? Well, we should care about them because they're the default mechanism that new nodes um, use to learn about existing nodes on the Bitcoin network. Right? So how, how does it work? We have the existing Bitcoin network somewhere on the internet, right? There's all of these nodes that know about each other and are connected to each other. Um, and if we spin up a fresh node, it's going to start with a database of, of peers that is empty because it doesn't know about any Bitcoin nodes yet. And that's where the DNS seeds come into play. Currently, there's nine of them. They are hard-coded into the Bitcoin uh, core source code. Um, and for illustration purposes, I've shown three here. And the way it works is um, your re purposing a little bit the DNS um, protocol. Usually you use it to resolve domain names into IPs and vice versa, but in the case of Bitcoin seed nodes, you just send a DNS lookup and the DNS seed is gonna answer with a bunch of addresses which your Bitcoin Core client will interpret as nodes on the Bitcoin network. Um, so you can store these, um, these nodes in your peers database and when you spin up your node for the first time, it's gonna ask, all of these DNS seeds for nodes, um, they're gonna send you some, some, some replies and you can store it in, in your uh, database and then you can start connecting to the uh, P2P network. Um, so now that we know how this process works, we can formulate some requirements for the DNS seeds. First of all, we want them to have uh, good availability. Um, whenever we ask a DNS seed for nodes, it should reply and be up. Um, when it comes to the nodes that are advertised by the DNS seeds, we also can formulate some requirements. Um, we want these nodes to actually be available, right? So we don't want a node that's been uh, active a month ago and when, when we learn about it and we try to connect to it, it it's not available. Um, we want those nodes to be unique in the sense that if DNS seed one provides us with nodes A, B, and C, we don't want another C to also provide us with nodes A, B, and C again, because that's just like no new information. Um, and also we want them to be variable, so over time, um, we don't want uh, a C to provide us with the same nodes every time we ask it, because that could lead to various problems. Um, uh, if the, the people that are running these nodes that are provided start to behave in a malicious way. It's just um, a good idea to have the, the, the DNS seeds provide new um, seeds every time you ask them. And also, the number of uh, nodes provided by the seeds uh, is interesting because the larger the number, the less of the uh, impact that these three problems up here I described as. So let's look at some uh, actual data. You can see uh, historical data for the number of nodes advertised by all of the seeds together. Uh, over a um, time range of the last three months. And as you can see, uh, there's around 300 seats that are um, advertised, no, 300 nodes that are advertised by the seats. You can see the occasional dip uh, here and there. And uh, to figure out what's going on here, you can actually break down the data by seat. So each of these nine colors represents one uh, of, of the nine available um, DNS seeds, and as you can see here, the, one of the dips was caused by the green DNS seed not delivering any nodes to us, um, which means it was probably down, and the other times it was the red seed, and I think by now you've figured out why I didn't put any labels on there. It, it is because I didn't want to step on, onto anyone's toes. Um, and I'd like to talk more about this, but uh, unfortunately, or what, for, for some reason, this uh, talk is about the DNS uh, not about DNS seeds, but the P2P network. So let's just have a look at the summary. Uh, you can do the same um, not only for the node, you can do the same for the node count, which I'm showing here, the availability, which, which you can see here. For example, the purple um, node uh, provides only about 
50% of reachable nodes, which means that if it provides you with 20 Bitcoin nodes when you ask it, 10 of them are not going to be active when you try to connect to them, which is a problem. Um, you can do the same with the duplicate node share and the stale node share, but um, actually I'd like to make a point that what you see here is actually pretty good to have these different profiles for each node, um, which, which implies that, that DNS seeds run different um, software and having like um, a problem or being an outlier in the negative sense here might lead to being uh, an outlier here in the good sense and having this diverse set of uh, DNS seed software actually is what makes the, the system robust. Okay, um, yeah, but let's come to the more interesting part um, which actually involves the um, Bitcoin P2P network and I'd like to begin by sharing the method I used um, for collecting some of the data. Um, so let's assume our crawler has already ob obtained a number of addresses for uh, nodes on the Bitcoin network by asking the DNS seeds. And the way the crawler works is it, it performs a handshake with one of the nodes, and this works by sending a version message. It gets back a version message, and the ver version message contains stuff like what protocol version is this node running? What uh, node services are there, is it a full node, is it a pruned node, what user agent is running on that node, is it Bitcoin Core, is it Bitcoin Nots or whatever. Um, and we're going to store all of this in our crawler database. Then there's not just the explicitly exchanged stuff, but also like metadata, like when did we connect to this node, how long did it take to connect to the node, and stuff like that, which we're also storing in the database. And then we're doing... Um, um, we're inquiring about peers that are known by that node, okay? So we're requesting, please tell me what are the Bitcoin nodes do you know? We're, we're getting a reply, um, and that's the way we learn about more nodes on the network in addition to the ones provided by the DNS seeds, and we're going to store these as well in our database. And obviously we're going to allocate a new uh, row, let's call it, in our database for all of the um, nodes that we've received because um, in the next step we're going to continue this with the same process for, for all of the nodes. So we're going to crawl all of the nodes. Um, and now you might rightfully criticize, hey, crawlers have been around for a while. There's various websites providing stats and stuff like that, so why are you reinventing the wheel? And I'd like to counter this with the following list. Um, um, so far, some data I was interested in was not getting collected. Also, um, some or most of these, um, these um, existing websites that provide data don't share all of the methodology they use to collect the data, or maybe they're not uh, open sourcing all parts of the implementation, um, and it's hard to estimate the quality of the data provided by these websites. Um, and to make this point clear, let's try this very simple metric of the number of active nodes on the Bitcoin network. There's multiple sources for it. For example, there's Luke's website and there's um, um, Kaltry University in Germany that provides some numbers. There's BitNodes. And I thought, well, let's try it again. Maybe my numbers can serve as a tiebreaker. Surely one of them gets it correct, but alas, no, that's not the case. So four different sources, four different uh, numbers. Um, so let's dive in and try to figure out what's going on here. The, Obvious thing to do is to break down the total uh, node count by network type. Um, so for example, uh, the blue part is just nodes that run on the IPv4 network. And it turns out that um, uh, Luke is, is only providing number for uh, IPv4 nodes. And then the numbers um, from um, Karlsruhe and mine are pretty much in agreement. Bit nodes is a bit lower. Yeah. Um, for IPv6, which uh, Luke is not providing, again, the numbers uh, by uh, Karlsruhe and, and me are pretty much in agreement. Um, BitNode, again, is a little bit lower, and to figure out what's actually going on, um, you, you need some additional data that is not available yet by these other sources. So let's take a look. Um, Fortunately, the source code for the BitNodes crawler is available, and at some point you, you stumble upon the following variable, uh, which, uh, which defines um, what nodes received by other peers you're actually crawling. So I, I told you before, you send other nodes uh, a get address, 
message, and then they provide you with notes they know about. And in addition to the address of the note, they also provide you with a timestamp when this note was last, last seen. And what BitNotes does is they're only uh, looking or only crawling notes that have been seen in the past eight hours. So if you actually plot a histogram um, of whether notes are available or not, so orange means they are not reachable, blue means they are reachable, um, and I should point out that this is a log scale here, the bulk of, of, of 10K or more notes is actually, has actually been seen very recently. Um, then you can see uh, a decay over time, and if, you, if you're neglecting all of the notes that are older than eight hours, you're gonna miss out on, on some, some of the notes. And that's the explanation why bit notes numbers are lower than uh, Karlsruhe's and mine. Then there's onion notes, which are only provided by bit notes, um, but the gap here widens even more, uh, and the question is why, why does that happen? The previous um, effect of um, the, the notes to consider doesn't explain that large of a gap. So if you look at the uh, code again, you will find that there's a timeout for connecting to a node uh, in the bit notes crawler, which is 15 seconds. And this is all very, very good for IPv4 and IPv6, but due to the design of, of the uh, Tor network, the latencies are much, much higher. So if you plot the connection time of the different nodes, um, if you do a histogram, uh, you find that a lot of nodes have a connection time of less than 10 seconds, but if you're cutting off at 15 seconds, you're gonna lose uh, a lot of nodes, which explains uh, the discrepancy. And then there's uh, I2P nodes, which um, granted is like some sort of uh, new thing that's, uh, that's happening. Uh, other sites aren't explaining this. Um, uh, and, and yeah, so that adds on, on top of the difference. Um, yeah, so I hope um, that using this simple metric, uh, I could drive home the point that it makes sense to collect this, this additional data and, and actually have it on hand. But uh, moving from simple metrics to new insights that you can generate, let's try to shed some light on the P2P network structure. And to do this, um, let's first talk about some address manager quirks. Um, I told you before, you can ask nodes for um, peers they know about but what I didn't tell you before is that nodes only um, store addresses of nodes that are on the same network that they're actively participating in. That means if, if this node is running only on the IPv4 network, all of the addresses that you will receive in reply will be IPv4 addresses. Um, as another example, if there's a multi-network node that is running both on the IPv6 network and the Onion network or on the Tor network, you're gonna get IPv6 and Onion addresses as a reply. Now you can do some interesting stuff with that. Um, what I've plotted here is um, the total number of IPv4 nodes on the x-axis, the share of them, and on the y-axis it's a breakdown of the address or the network types of the addresses that were received uh, in reply to a get address message. And what that means is, um, so for example here, around 30% of all IPv4 nodes only reply with other IPv4 node addresses. And you can infer from that that these nodes are only running on the IPv4 network. And using this data, you can actually try to estimate the number of unique nodes because if you're um, counting whatever, like a thousand active nodes on the network, there might actually just be 500 unique nodes and another 500 which are actually both active on the IPv4 and the IPv6 network. Um, yeah, and you can do that, for example, here's another cutoff. You know that these nodes that provide both IPv4 and IPv6 addresses run on, on both of these networks and so on. And from that, you, you can actually estimate that there's around um, 1,300, uh, 13,000 unique nodes, which is uh, only about 70% of all the active nodes. Um, I've measured, and here's some, I'm trying to visualize how the network um, structure looks like. Um, each uh, Bitcoin node over here represents 1%, or is supposed to represent 1% of the network. Um, and you'll find that there's 15% of the network is running IPv4 only nodes, 6% are running IPv6 only nodes, and then there's 17% uh, that are running both IPv4 and IPv6 which kind of serves as a conduit between these two uh, IPv4 and IPv6 only networks. 
Interestingly, 50% of the network is running Onion only. This seems to be Umbrel. And then the rest of it is um, nodes that run all three of these net networks, which, which connect these two parts together. Um, yeah, so, so some of the insights, half of the network is actually anonymous. We have good network cohesion. I'd say like 12% of the network that serves to connect these two halves is pretty good. Um, but still, it's important to ma maintain nodes on multiple networks. Um, so I think uh, a good way to contribute to the network cohesion is to just add Tor to your existing IPv4 and IPv6 uh, node. Okay, the second insight I'd like to talk about concerns autonomous systems. Um, and again, you might ask yourself, what is an autonomous system? Why should I care about it? You can think uh, of an autonomous system as just the, the big players on the internet that control uh, multiple IP addresses, and all of the Bitcoin network can be assigned to these different autonomous systems or big players based on their IP address. Um, so for example, Google, Google Cloud uh, will, will be a big part of the network and Amazon, and then there's smaller ASN uh, uh, autonomous systems like, like providers, and, and there's large providers, small providers, and so on. And what you want is you want to avoid your node connecting to just a single autonomous system because in case an attacker, I mean, each autonomous system can be interpreted as being under the control of a single entity and you don't want your node to connect to just uh, nodes under the control of a single entity. So you can look at the, the distribution of the Bitcoin nodes in the network um, onto uh, different autonomous systems. I've ordered them here by, by size. So, so zero is just the, the biggest autonomous system, which contains about 1,000 nodes. And the first thing that you'll notice is that this is a power law distribution, which totally makes sense, because whenever economic incentives are in play, we, we'll we're dealing with the winner-takes-all scenario. If you're the cheapest cloud provider, everyone's going to want to host their nodes with you. Um, to get some actual insights out of, out of, out of this graph, we're, we're going to switch to a log axis on, on the y-axis. Um, and uh, w what we can see is that 50% of all of the autonomous systems that comprise the Bitcoin network just contribute a single node. On the other hand, the top 1% of all autonomous systems um, provide more than 50% of the nodes on the Bitcoin network. So this is a pretty, pretty, um, yeah, pretty, um, yeah, it's not that good. <laughs> Let's just say it like that. Um, we can even zoom in more and look at the top 20 uh, autonomous systems by node count, and you'll realize that the cloud providers here are uh, contributing most. Uh, of, of the nodes in the top three places, and if we do a breakdown of orange is a, like a hoster, and purple is the more organic people running at their homes at node with an ISP, you'll find that um, the hosted nodes largely outnumber the, the self-hosted nodes. Um, Hetzner alone, um, which is, seems to be one of the cheapest cloud providers, com um, provides roughly 13% of all nodes, and the top three um, cloud providers provide more than 25% of all nodes. Now, why is this a problem? Let's talk about this, this uh, attack potential I've mentioned previously. Um, so this is the, the benign situation, like it looks today. Um, what happens if an attacker spins up a lot of malicious nodes, the red nodes in, in, at Google, or maybe Google turns evil, or maybe they get a letter from the government and everything is evil. Um, and because each node has the same probability of, of receiving an outbound connection. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I'll talk about that later. Yeah. Um, so if you if you have this situation, there's a, a chance that your node will end up being connected only to malicious nodes, which opens the door to all kinds of attacks, right? It's an eclipse attack. They can prevent you from learning about new blocks, new transactions, and you don't want that. And the way um, to thwart this kind of attack is um, a SMAP, which is already implemented in Bitcoin Core, but not enabled by default. And the way it works is um, each node knows about these different autonomous systems and the IPs they control. So 
after connecting to one of the nodes uh, at Google, which in this example is hosting the evil nodes, it will not con your node will not connect to another node from this autonomous system, but instead choose another autonomous system, okay? And that's a way to hopefully only uh, connect to benign nodes, or at least one or more benign nodes. Um, so far, so good, but uh, learning about the distribution in the previous slides, some, some uh, intuitively, I got some, some yeah, uh, it, it felt like some, something could, could be problematic if we deploy ASMAP. Um, and I'd like to talk about some second order effect because the primary effect is, yes, you're not connecting to, to a single entity that is controlling all of these malicious nodes, but uh, the, the second order effect is that if you add more nodes, um, you're gonna find that the outgoing connections of each node are now equally distributed across autonomous systems and no longer across um, all the nodes, which means that the probability of incoming connections is determined by whether your node is in a large autonomous system or in a small one. Um, obviously, after your node has connected to Google, to one node from Google, the probability of um, all of the other nodes that are hosted by Google of receiving another connection from your node is zero. So um, this is, all of these nodes become undesirable to you. Um, whereas small autonomous systems have uh, more desirable nodes because, um, well, you want to connect to an autonomous system, there's only one node in there, so the probability of getting a connection is pretty high. So what are some of the potential implications on network health of ASMAP? Well, we could see something like incoming connection thrashing. If you're a node in one of these uh, small autonomous systems and all of the, uh, th there's a high probability of nodes on the network uh, connecting to you, um, there's a good chance that you're actually saturating the limit of 125 incoming connections that uh, is enabled by default. Um, and everyone is just, hammering these nodes and wants to open connections from them. Maybe some of the existing ones get preempted. They end up being in a situation where they have to find a new connection. They, they are going to another of these small autonomous systems and this could be a problem. So we're also going to see some higher load for these nodes in the small autonomous systems. And also I think there's going to be some effects on network cohesion and to um, get some more insights about this because thinking intuitively about stuff like this is, is pretty hard. Uh, I wrote a simulator and what you can see here or what the simulator does is just um, taking a bunch of uh, listening nodes and um, non-listening nodes and randomly connecting them together based on the current um, network connection policy. Um, so what you can see here is the distribution of the number of incoming connections for uh, the listening nodes for 5,000 non-listening nodes. Um, um, you can see it's pretty normally distributed. You can actually analytically compute the mean because if there's 5,000 non-listening nodes and 8,000 listening nodes, 13,000 in total, each node is opening 10 connections. Uh, that makes for 130,000 connections and you divide it by 8,000 because that's the number of listening nodes you have, you end up with 16 point something, which is actually the mean of the distribution. Um, now because um, the, the connection is formed randomly, you can actually run this multiple times, and here I did it thrice, and you can see that the results are pretty stable, despite the ran randomness. Um, you, we can now compare this to the connection policy if we use ASMAP, and you can see that um, while the mean is the same, there's a larger sigma. For, for this normal distribution. Uh, and as it turns out, it's, it's, it's actually not a normal distribution anymore, but something different. So if we keep increasing the number of non-listening nodes, if there's 10,000 nodes, 15,000 nodes, 20,000 nodes, 25,000, you can see that there's this weird bump on what used to be this normal distribution, and we can keep playing this game, and what it, uh, what's gonna happen is that uh, the, the nodes that see a large number of connections actually correspond to the nodes that are in these small autonomous systems, these desirable nodes, right? Uh, whereas these nodes in the large autonomous systems um, will see a lower demand for, for incoming connections. And it gets worse, uh, we can keep going. Um, and what happens is exactly what I was talking about before, everyone's gonna want to connect to these um, 
desirable nodes in the small autonomous systems, they get to the connection limit of 125 um, connections, while you still have a large chunk of the network, the, the ones at Google, Hetzner, and so on, who are only seeing a limited number of, of connections. Um, now, you could argue, argue this is not a real problem. What's more important is whether each node manages to open 10 outbound connections. So we can also um, yeah, <laughs> take a look at the number of outbound connections. So this is a comparison be between uh, the current node connection policy and AS map for 70,000 non-listening nodes. And as you can see, 100% of, of both connection policies managed to open 10 outgoing connections. Um, for 80,000 nodes as well, um, for 85,000, we can see that suddenly not all of the nodes um, managed to open 10 outbound connections, and this gets worse and worse with time. Um, yeah, so what happens is once all of these desirable autonomous systems are saturated, the remaining nodes cannot find new autonomous systems to open connections to, or new nodes that are in uh, autonomous systems that they aren't yet connected to. Um, yeah, so with everything I just said, I want to just put a big caveat on this, and I've used a special font to highlight how big of a caveat it is. Um, all of this is based on simulation data, obviously. I mean, in the wild, the situation might be totally different. Um, it might not even be an issue. Um, if you're working on, on AS map stuff and have some insights, I, I'd be happy to sync. Um, so, yeah, let me know. Okay, that's it. Um, thanks for listening. Question? Test, test. Could the AS map stuff be self healing in that people know it's there, therefore they don't run on Amazon and it solves the problem? That's a good question. You, you, we would have to ask the people. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Love the honesty. Um, <laughs> another question over there. Um, do you have, have you come up with an, uh, an idea how to measure the number of non-listening nodes? Because as you can see, the result is heavily skewed towards yeah. listening nodes, which is why the tour looks like the majority, but it's probably like a small minority, or maybe not. Um, I, I think there's a way. I mean, I, I, I mentioned before that you, you, can, you can calculate the mean, the, the, the equation I used to calculate the mean of this distribution is like number of listening nodes plus number of non-listening nodes times 10 because each of them opens 10 connections and then you divide it by the number of listening nodes and you get to some value which is the mean. And in the same way, you could run a number of listening nodes on the network, count the number of inbound connections, and solve this equation for the number of non-listening nodes. Yeah, looking forward to seeing that number. <laughs> <laughs> um, more questions? I just wanted to uh, get some clarification. In your simulation for the current behavior, is that just doing it uh, choosing nodes randomly, or are you doing the slash 16? Yeah, I'm doing uh, the slash 16, which okay. is why it says prefix. 16 for IPv4 and 32, I think, for, or 64 for IPv6. The, the, the AS map, is it dynamic, or is it taken from BGP, or how do we, how do we build that, the AS map? Uh, there's no like, of, like f f standard way of building it. Um, actually, there, currently, there are discussions how to best provide it for, for users. Um, maybe maybe um, there will be some open source tool to build it and then people can download it and use it together with their Bitcoin node, but maybe we also provide um, um, just code to replicate it yourself. So, so this is, it should be decentralized and verifiable. Um, yeah, yeah. Awesome, any more questions guys? Yeah, one at the back there. So I can give you um, like an actual example of this effect um, with you know connections to a um, obscure ASs because I, I deliberately tried to exploit this when I turned on a bunch of full RBF nodes very early on to make sure that they would all get you know peered properly, and I picked a whole bunch of very obscure Ukrainian ISPs because you know why not give them some money, and that's exactly what I saw. 
you know, it, all, all this obscure stuff, of course, they all got flooded with connections, which fortunately they, you know, they could all handle it. But, you know, I can, I can say I've seen this in real life, so I'm certain, I'm certain you're correct. Okay, that's, that's interesting. Nice. Okay. What? Not sure if there's an interaction there, but yeah, it's a good seal of approval. Um, any more questions, or should we take a break? I think that's it. Um, round of applause for Virtue or Johannes. <laughs> really interesting stuff. Um, uh, we've got a 10, 15-minute break now. Uh, given that it's, what, 3.48, uh, come back here for just after 4.00.